Thank you, Mara, and uh, good morning, everybody. Morning. We are really pleased to be back in Dublin. It's uh, the third visit on uh, the Seth E invoicing. We also had numerous other visits uh, in the course of uh, the Pebble project and many other things. My name is Christian. Uh, I'm from Denmark and been in charge of uh, rolling out mandatory e invoicing back in 2000. And Seven until 2013, also working for the Norwegian government. And together with me, I have a uh, Swedish colleague. Yes, my name is Martin Forsberg. And uh, I've also been working with the Swedish public sector in implementing a mandatory e-invoicing. Uh, so, yeah. looking forward to this now. So, the Commission is, uh, is regarding Ireland as one of the best in class in Europe right now. Uh, Ireland is uh, one of the first movers within the new standard, within rolling out uh, new initiatives around Pebble. And uh, also, from seeing uh, this audience and this setup, it's also best in class for organizing such events. It's always uh, nice to come here because it's uh, neatly presented, and you have a lot of uh, de very good uh, demographics and, and presentation material that really makes it uh, valuable to the community. So, uh, so we are also uh, learning from that. Uh, during the course of today, we will go through all our slides. We, uh, we had a, a limited time scope here, so we cut it down from 1,400 slides to around <laughs> 60, uh, bringing the core essentials. Uh, but naturally, uh, you're more than welcome to connect with us, uh, get our contact details, ask questions, uh, also with our colleagues at the government here. Um, but we will also introduce uh, uh, a small tool, as I mentioned, called Slido, where we will uh, like to learn from your situation. Because one thing is what we can provide you of information, uh, another thing is that uh, we would also like to learn how the Commission, as well as the different experts around Europe, can support the community here. Yeah. And you can use Slido for two things, uh, answer our polls and also ask questions. And so we will go through those questions in the end of, of each presentation. And uh, so you can just use your mobile phone, uh, put slido.com in, uh, in the browser, and enter uh, the code here. And uh, then you will be um, presented with a question. And um, so you now have an opportunity to look on your phones without. And the more who joins, the, the, the more fun it is. <laughs> it's sort of like the same thing with e invoicing. Um, I, I, was, I was thinking some, some, uh, some, some different uh, uh, things here, but, but let, let's try to go into the questions now yeah. and uh, see uh, how many is, is connected. So should we uh, change it? I, I was given a, a thumbs up and uh, then somebody back there is doing some magic for us. Hopefully it works. So... Oh, here we are. Uh, yeah, I think we should be in presenter mode. Click on the... Present mode. Present mode, up there. Right hand, up, 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 up. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. great. <laughs> Thank you. So now, uh, the first question is, who are you and what is your main interest? Uh, yeah, I can take... The... So I'm interested in technical aspects. I'm interested from a user perspective. I'm interested. Oh, uh, I live and breathe e-invoicing. <laughs> so. Yeah, perhaps the, our uh, dear yeah. colleagues at the back. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, good. So, unfortunately, not like us. There's not that many that live and breathe e-invoicing. You have other things. No, in but life. there's obviously a few. Yeah. <laughs> um, good to see the business aspects. Now, naturally, uh, from a business point of view, and especially on the concerns of the supply side, we are aware that uh, these concern, concerns are mutually addressed also in other member states. Each member state has made their own progress in, on how to include the micro SMEs and what kind of tools are available. And there are some different uh, takeaways that, uh, that we can provide during today. Uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is something that, uh, that would we hear often. So, this seems to work. F 54 uh, uh, responses so far. Uh, yeah, still, still counting. And we see a clear tendency. We can, we, I think we can jump to the next question. Yeah. Uh, have you participated on any of the previous events? OK, good. Okay. This is good news. So, so then uh, we have uh, some information for at least half of you that you never had before, perhaps. So, uh, um, 
Okay, I All think right. we see the... the so, uh, back to, um, to the presentation. Um, Great. So, Martin, you will take us through the first couple of slides, yes, and I'll I will. try to support your best possible way. So, um, you will get a lot of information today from Mora and the team about your national strategies and how to comply with e-invoicing and the tools that are available for you. Uh, we will also give you now a more uh, a perspective from, from a European pers uh, view uh, and how different uh, uh, countries are addressing this. So let's start from a very, very, a very basic question. Uh, what is an electronic invoice? It might sound like a silly question here, but if you ask this question to your colleagues at home or to your, your uh, suppliers, you will probably not necessarily get the same answer as what you ask the legislative people in Brussels who came up with the directive. So typically, if you, if you ask your supplier, what is an electronic invoice, and do you do e-invoicing, they will say, yes, of course, we are sending PDF invoices to all our suppliers by email and so on. And this is probably also from a consumer perspective. I receive electronic invoices all the time when I'm purchasing on the web and so on. Others say that, okay, in our organization, we are working with e-invoicing because we receive, okay, we receive paper invoices, but we scan them, and then we have a workflow for an electronic workflow system where we approve and assess and, and do automatic accounting and stuff. So, yeah, we are doing electronic invoicing. And then a third answer could be, yes, we are doing electronic invoicing because we are exchanging structured data according to a specific standard. So we issue invoices electronically, we send them electronically, and we receive them electronically in a structured format. So all these questions could be true. Uh, now we have a directive which gives a definition, and this is very helpful. An electronic invoice in the context of, the European, uh, of this directive is that it's an invoice that has been issued, transmitted, received in a structured electronic format, which allows for its automatic and electronic processing. So that means that PDF invoices and scanning of paper is not electronic invoicing according to the directive. And uh, so I think that is perhaps very, very basic, but worth telling uh, still because there is a lot of misunderstandings around this topic. So the directive is bringing a lot of benefits, and different countries are picking up on these benefits differently, and, and they become more or less uh, crucial for their, uh, for their strategies on implementing e-invoicing. But just to tell a few, e-invoicing can help on swift payments. It simplifies cross-border procurement. Uh, it's, uh, it, the, the standard makes IT systems interoperable so that they can speak without lots of modifications and consultants hours and, and integration. Um, the, if you automate the invoicing process, you reduce a lot of working time. You will hear numbers like 20,000 invoices being uh, handled every day. Uh, you know, in, it, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, time that can be reduced that way. Also, it gives traceability of public expenditure, uh, and it can improve tax collection. And if you look at a country like Norway or, or Sweden, who were early adopters of electronic invoicing, it was primarily the automotive, automation that was the driving force behind implementing it, so to simplify, to digitalize, to, to, uh, uh, to, to reduce unnecessary time, just yes, carrying around papers and, you know. Um, but other countries are more going for the tax collective work uh, 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 um, to, to re reduce uh, tax evasion. So looking at Italy, for example, every invoice being sent in Italy goes through a central system or clearing which uh, the, the government owns, so the tax authority can keep track of every invoice, how much VAT uh, is on the invoice, and then they can follow this up with what uh, is actually being paid in the end. And we have that approach in Italy, we have it in Spain, and some other countries. So even the directive can help uh, uh, support this, uh, depending on, on, on your needs. And if I understand it correctly from a, 
uh, Irish perspective is primarily about automating and to digitalize uh, administrative processes and also to help Swiss payments and, and uh, help suppliers as the driving force. So uh, if we look at um, the directive itself, there is one article which is crucial. It sets the, the minimum requirements on the public entities. Um, it says that all public uh, or contracting authorities or entities must be able to process and receive electronic invoices that are compliant with the European standard and which follows any of the syntaxes on a list. This is what it says. Uh, Mora said earlier that there were two XML formats that you need to be able to receive. And these are the two syntaxes on the list. Uh, two, for, two technical formats. The European standard, it describes all the business terms in an electronic invoice. So it, the semantic model, which is also referred to, uh, defines things like what is an invoice number, what is an issue date, what, what is uh, the delivery location, what is an, uh, the product name, and so on. All the business terms that pops up on an, on an invoice, these are standardized in a it's kind of a glossary. And each of these business terms have a location in the technical formats, so they are, in a way, equivalent. So, just quickly, an electronic invoice is issued, it's transmitted, it's received, and electronically, we have a, a glossary or a semantic model of all the business terms, and we have two different syntaxes, and each business term has a specific location in the syntax. So, that is the lingo being used when talking about e-invoicing in the context of the European Directive. From a user perspective, you, only, you, you see the, uh, the invoice on screen as any invoice presented. Uh, you, don't, you will probably never have to come into contact with these technical aspects, the XML files and so on, if you are working on the business side. Um, so. We've seen some of the dates already. The a April last year was the, the, uh, the deadline for the member states. Um, there was a possibility to, to uh, extend one year for the sub-central. Some countries have used this extension uh, possibility, uh, including Ireland. Uh, and looking at this, the this, uh, uh, state of play now, these numbers, they come from what is called the country fact sheets. So each country has a representative who submits information about the national uh, strategy on e-invoicing. So these numbers are drawn from the country fact sheets. Um, and what we, what we see from that is that 25 out of 28 member states have transposed directive, the directive for, for uh, the central level. 13 countries have asked for this extension for the sub-central um, then we made it yellow here, or orange, because 23 out of 28 say that they have an e-invoicing solution in place. And that should be taken with a grain of, of salt. Uh, it's easy to say, you know, yes, we have an e-invoicing solution because we have you know, a website where you can key in your invoice. But it's, it's not necessarily a, a really workable solution in all of these situations. Uh, some say, perhaps, yes, we have an e-invoicing solution. We are using Peppel, but there are no one connected to Peppel yet. So it's very much a, 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 it might look like this has, the whole situation has been solved. It has not. It's still quite patchy around Europe on the capabilities on the compliance of e-invoicing. But we are getting there. Um, yeah, so there are a few countries that have a, a bit of a problem with the transposition of the directive. Uh, we don't have to go into exactly which ones, but, and also uh, the 13 countries that have uh, asked for the extension. Uh, and looking also, how did the, com the member states actually transpose the directive? Uh, this is, uh, a directive needs to be transposed into national legislation. And you ha at least you have to live up to the requirement in the directive, but you can also go further if you want. And we have typically three strategies for this. Those who take the directive, implement it as is, and I think Ireland is an example of that, 
meaning that it is now mandatory for at least the subcentral, soon the subcentral, to be able to receive invoices that comply with the European standard. It doesn't say anything about that the supplier must send. It just says that you must be ready to receive. So if, you're not, if, if you just keep quiet about it, you will not get any invoice ever, because your suppliers will not have any mandate to, to send. Uh, of course, then you have done a big investment for no, for no purpose. <laughs> Uh, so, many countries have gone for, for a, an approach where they, okay, we leg, on the legislative side, we make sure that every public entity can receive, and then we add rules or policies that in each tender, it's mandatory to require e-invoicing. So, over time, where we have new contracts, we will get e-invoicing, including as a contractual requirement in the tender. That is one approach. Netherlands and, and others have uh, gone through this. I also think uh, uh, Norway. Um, and then we have the third type, where the trans uh, transposition is that the, the public side must be able to receive and the suppliers must send electronically. It's not legal anymore to send paper. <coughs> and we have a handful of countries that have done this. Uh, Croatia, Italy, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, Estonia, I think. Um, and of course, this is overnight, you will reach you know, high, high numbers, almost 100% uh, electronic invoices, because it's illegal to do anything else. So this is like the big boom. The, the countries who have done this, most of them have been working quite a long, quite long time. So they have prepared, or they have invested a lot in information campaigns or, or so on. I mentioned that even uh, in, in Italy, who is uh, the country that has the most ambitious uh, approach, also mandates uh, uh, e-invoicing between businesses. So you have to send all your invoices electronically through a specific system, which I mentioned before, the tax evasion control system. So with that, I'll hand over to Christian to talk a little bit about uh, methods of exchange of e-invoicing. We will soon come into PEPL, mm -hmm. but first we will look at other approaches that are, uh, that have been used you know, historically and also sometimes now. Sometimes it's good to understand both the legacy from some of the countries, but also the mechanics of, of how to exchange the invoices. Because having a standard for the invoice doesn't necessarily say how you should exchange it. So each country has walked their own path. And we can see that, that those are now conveying into, uh, into a, a, a single route, and that is uh, probably, uh, as we mentioned, Peppel, uh, both in, in Declan Paul's and Morris' presentation this morning. So um, for the different countries, they have taken those who have a, a heavy, heavy legacy within e-invoicing in the past, uh, such as, for instance, Denmark, that was one of the first to mandate, they have taken different routes uh, towards introducing this. We have seen uh, examples of where there are central hub systems uh, established so that the SMEs and especially the micro SMEs would benefit from entering into a, a, a portal-like solution of the government or even for the individual entity. This means that a supplier would be able to manually enter their invoice into the system and then the public entity would be able to enter the system and pull out the information that they need to pay the invoice. This is, uh, this is, of course, uh, very good for the individual public entity and it's also good for the individual supplier if they are having a one-to-one -one connection. Another thing is that we have also seen that, that many of the countries already have different uh, infrastructural components in place. This means that they have proprietary protocols uh, already developed and this means that it is costly for the suppliers to exchange this. So whatever solution we, we, we come up with, both from a European side, but also here in Ireland, have to be cost efficient and, of course, uh, 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 easy to come by with from a technology point of view. So we get a lower barrier for, for entering into this. So th these two are, are very good from, from a point-to-point -point communication. But the thing is, what happens if a supplier have multiple buyers around Europe, or even in the country, and they use different portals? We have examples of, of suppliers who had to enter in hundreds of different invoices in hundreds of different uh, supplier uh, buyer systems in order to actually do the invoicing uh, across border. 
And this is the case where the, the, the chain is falling off for, for the, especially the, the micro SMEs and, uh, and the medium sized uh, SMEs uh, because it is becoming very problematic for them and costly in, in the handling of, of issuing the invoice or creating in all these portals. Yeah, yeah I, we have this, uh, it's probably, I don't know the, how true it is, but it's, it's been told many times. I don't know if that necessarily makes it more true, but. They say that there was an American company, a big company, issuing invoices to their European uh, customers, and they had to log into 200 different portals every month to key in the invoices, uh, because each buyer had their own solution that was uh, unique for them. So yeah. 200 passwords, 200 usernames, different languages, uh, you know, different semantics, different business terms. Uh, and all of that. So. Even uh, for a front-running country like Denmark, it was one of, one of the cases. We, uh, we did uh, a lot of mitigating procedures uh, for, the, uh, for the suppliers, for the SMEs. Uh, we had a transition period where you could uh, submit your paper invoice to be scanned, to be forwarded to public sector. That was cut off. Then we had some different e-invoicing portals. Uh, and of course, it might work for Denmark, but it actually becomes a trade barrier for the rest of Europe because how would, how would suppliers from, from even Sweden or others be able to accommodate for, for these uh, Danish national systems? So instead, um, what we have uh, now, and a, a very common solution, uh, is that many of the countries are now uh, complementary, setting up different uh, access points uh, towards what we... Uh, in daily terms called e-delivery messaging. E-delivery is the general um, architecture behind Pebble, and we'll come back to that uh, and explain it a little bit later. But here, they, uh, it will be possible uh, to set up access points both on the supplier side, but also at the central uh, entities to accept uh, invoices directly from the supplier's ERP system. Now we, we, we started talking, but still the, 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 the right and the, the correct benefits is still not there because all the public entities still have to connect to these centralized solutions. So um, uh, we actually would like to move forward and have a situation where all the suppliers and all the, the buyers would be able to, to select their preferred choice. And this is, this is done uh, in general with the case here where, where we are connecting e-delivery across uh, the, the, the full threshold of both the buyers and suppliers. This means that we would enable the public entities uh, to select their service providers, their uh, preferred choice of uh, service providers with access points. Um, perhaps some of these service providers have e-invoicing portals themselves. Perhaps they have different um, uh, uh, choices for, for the access point, and then they might even have other legacy systems that you will benefit from. But this is, this is the case. So it would be up to each public entity, and this is also the, 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 the idea behind the, the frameworks that you have here in Ireland, that you as a public entity would be able to, to go out and, 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 and pick uh, the ones that, that you decide upon, or you can actually uh, submit a, a request for that. The whole idea is that um, within Pebble or within Italy, we are operating with what we call a four-corner model. Um, and on the one hand side, we have the buyers that, are, that uh, can select a service provider uh, in which they want to receive uh, the different invoices. And on the other hand, we will have the suppliers uh, and they will be able to, to connect with their service providers. The four corner model in, in that sense is that you have the, in corner one and four, you have the, the suppliers and the buyers, and then you have the different service providers in corner two and three. And this is the mantra. What happens is that, um, that, uh, that uh, in between the service providers, there are agreements made on how to govern, uh, monitor, and, uh, and uh, transfer these, these uh, standard documents. So essentially, e-invoicing is just the first step. Uh, once you have e-invoicing in place, the next business-related document, or even other types of documents within health sector or justice or whatever, uh, is, 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 is becoming a, a, a next step for, for, for the different governmental entities of, throughout Europe and also here in Ireland, as, as you heard this morning. But perhaps I can add there that traditionally the four corner model has been used for 30, 40 years with electronic business. Yeah. Uh, but it tends to be quite a static approach and it needs a lot of configuration and setup 
tends to be project oriented when the buyer and the seller is going to connect. And this is where Pebble comes in, which smooths all of this up very much. Uh, we'll come back more about Pebble in a, in a minute, but there are a lot of problems if you, uh, if you don't have uh, many of the tools that's available in Pebble. Yeah, true. Um, the characteristics we hear from the suppliers and the SMEs is that it is extremely technical difficulties and um, uh, economic uh, burdens to exchange their, their, their service providers. And this means that it becomes a complicated procedures for them to even consider uh, submitting a, a, an electronic invoice instead of just doing like they always did. Uh, sometimes it's too expensive to onboard new partners. Uh, it's too expensive to have, uh, have new suppliers on, on board because uh, the, the, the cost of, of, uh, of setting this up in comparison to what you actually sell into the, the public sector, is, is, it doesn't balance enough. We also know for a fact that uh, in the past uh, uh, there has been a lot of interoperability and trust problems also between the service providers but also in the public, public sector. So Because one thing is agreeing upon um, uh, the standard uh, for the invoice, that's, that's, uh, that's okay, but another thing is also to, to agree upon how should we transport this and how should we validate that the sender and the receiver are who they are. And this is something that uh, is also solved to the to people. We have also seen that, um, that many of the agreements in the past have been, been ag agreed upon uh, bilaterally, which means that if I wanted to send an invoice to Martin, I would agree upon the standard that we could use a piece of toilet paper or we could use an electronic invoice, I don't know, I don't care. As long as he got it and I got my payment, it was fine. Uh, but it, it, uh, every time I put on new suppliers or new buyers, uh, the, 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 the amount of uh, work effort uh, in managing all these agreements is uh, going tremendously up. And then uh, the cross-border collaboration between the service, part of, uh, service partners is not always possible. Uh, especially because the service providers have a, a, a large cost burden in, in, uh, in being in the different countries, setting up uh, regional or local offices, but they're also uh, talking to each other depending on the different national legislation as well as, as regional demands. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, yeah before we switch over mm -hmm. the slide, that was a bit of a background of yes. the problems that we had in e invoicing before we uh, started using e-delivery mm. uh, and Pebble. So okay. we'll come back to, to Pebble again after, after a few questions to you. So if you bring yeah. up your phones again. Um, and, um, you should be happy for once you're allowed to sit with your phone during yeah, an event. Then, so it's, uh, so if you can check your emails. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this is... Uh, are we on? Yeah. Okay. So, in your opinion, is the concept of electronic invoicing well known in the public sector on the buyer side? Okay. We see that most of you have already answered this question. It's not well known. That's good to know. It it also means that you have a lot of work to build the knowledge internally, because e-invoicing it will affect a lot of people internally. Okay. And what about the private sector on the supplier side? Given the definitions we talked about, what an e-invoice is, is that a well-established concept or definition? One thing is being capable of receiving invoices, that's fine. But it's like having a phone and nobody to talk to, right? So, so we really need somebody who can actually transmit and uh, issue and transmit this electronically. And I think the, the, what the answer here is, uh, is uh, showing, it's very... Uh, it's the same thing in most countries, that the, the concept of an e-invoicing is well known in the, in the sense of a PDF invoice. Uh, so there is also here a lot of uh, knowledge building to, to, to work on uh, in your communication with your suppliers. Um, Do we have one more? I think there is one more yes. question before. So, this question is, what, barriers for mass adoption of e-invoicing. So let's say, in, in the case of Ireland, what is, be, what, what is uh, necessary to address? What is the biggest problem for having you know, huge amounts of e-invoices when you get up to 80, 90% of your, of your invoices electronically? What is? I'll give you a perspective here. Um, we have done some, uh, some uh, 
different analysis on, on the, the handling and issuing of invoices. We know that e each paper-based invoice emits around th uh, 36 grams of CO2. With 4 million invoices per year for the public sector in Ireland, it's 144,000 uh, kilos of CO2 at, at, uh, emission. So this is, this, is, this is a quite substantial number that you also have not only the cost and time benefit, but you also have some environmental benefits uh, for this. Um, and, uh, and we see that the, some of the countries are now picking up this, uh, this dialogue as well, because you can actually leverage some of, some of their, their other uh, legal burdens here in life uh, with uh, introducing electronic business documents. So, but... Um, okay, so yeah. this is lack of proper system solutions. I think that goes for both private and public. You have, but yeah. you still have that, you need to, to be prepared on the buyer side. Uh, and uh, um, often the, the, the last one here with lack of clear policy or requirements is often brought up as the biggest impediment that unless it is required, people will not change. Um, but, uh, okay. okay. So Let's go into back to uh, back to the PowerPoint.